as we're going through the book of Esther, seeing more and more the importance of knowing that God providentially is working out His perfect plan. We're looking at Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3. And we'll read through the whole chapter. It's only 15 verses. All right, Esther chapter number 3. Verse number 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamathada, or Hamadatha, there you go, Hamadatha, the Agagite, and, the, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servant, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. He And he thought, scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast per, or that is, the the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is, the month Adar. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to, unto Haman, the son of Hamathada, uh, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is, is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was, was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language in the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by posts into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar and to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for the commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The posts went out, being hasted by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We know that we live in some some troublesome times, and we thank you so much giving us a hope for the future that is grounded and rooted in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, that eventually every wrong will be made right, that your kingdom will come, that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we ask you to be with the message tonight. Help me as I speak. Help the passage to be understood and may may we turn our eyes to you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
To begin our time tonight, I want to do a little pop quiz for history. I love history, and I have some dates. That is probably the worst thing possible for a lot of people in that they say, oh, I hate history. Well, why is that? Because I can't remember any dates. Okay, these are easy, okay? But the last one is the most significant, so just stay with me. All right, what is the significance of July 4th, 1776? Okay, so it's Independence Day. Uh, now, true enough, the vote for independence was July 2nd. And John Adams even thought that was the day that everybody's going to celebrate. Well, sorry, John, the declaration says July 4th. So, so that's the day that we celebrate the independence uh, of our nation. How about this? Um, December 7th, 1941. The day that will live in infamy. All right, how about this one? November 22nd, 1963. Kennedy, yes. Yes, in fact, three people died that day specifically. Uh, one was JFK. The second one was C.S. Lewis, the one that wrote Narnia, a great Christian apologetic uh, person, as well as um, a man, atheist, last name Huxley. I only remember that because uh, one of my favorite preachers actually preached a sermon on that idea of, I don't really know what the text was, but it was a really interesting sermon. So three people died on the same day and what we can learn from that. So this is okay. So, okay, so let's see. April 15th, 1912. And it's not the invention of tax day. Uh, <laughs> It is the going down of the Titanic. Yes, it, it hit the iceberg on the 14th. It, it went under uh, at 2 o'clock a.m. that day. So, all right, last but not least, this is the one that is the, the number one thing to think about. May 14th, 1948. And that is, any guesses? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right, Susan. When Israel became an independent nation on May 14th, 1948, 73 years ago, two days ago, Israel became a nation. And think about it, 73 years later, around the pound, that time, now it's being attacked by Hamas and it's, being re it's retaliating with all these different missiles. When I first read about that on the news, I, I, I said, wow, there's a lot of things going on in the Middle East. Now, uh, the airlines have been canceled to go to the, the Promised Land. So if, if you really wanted to go to the Promised Land, <clears throat> now is definitely not the right time. I'll just, I'll just say that right up front. If you really want to go and tour the Promised Land, well, the Holy Land experience is just down the road. So, <laughs> but it's not quite the same. I understand that. But think about it. All <clears throat> Since May 14th, 1948, how much hostility the world has for the nation of Israel. I've heard it said that the boundaries of Israel right now is only the size of New Jersey. That's about how big it is. And New Jersey is not one of our biggest states either. So you think about how small Israel really is compared to everything else in the world that is coming against them. But yet, they're still around. It's just amazing. One person asked for evidence that there is a God. And he said, well... Here's my evidence that I know that there's a God is because I see a Jew on the subway. And they said, well, how does that show the existence of God? The Jews were a people not like any other people. They have been persecuted so much more than anybody else in the history of the world. And yet, there are still Jews to this day. You can't say that of the Hittites. You can't say that of the Malachites. You can't say that of all these other ites that, we, that they took care of in the land. You can't say that about all these other cultures that came and then are gone. The Jews remain. It's just amazing how God works in time. God helps Israel in such a, a mighty way. Even if we as the as United States of America will pull our 
resources from supporting Israel, which could very well happen in the next few months, Israel will still remain because God has chosen that people, that group. Now, not everything that country of Israel does is right. Uh, do you know that they do support abortions? They do legalize gay marriage. Yeah, so not everything that they do just because it's Israel doesn't make it right. But God still chose this people, this land, this group for a specific reason. And God, over the length of time, has protected Israel over and over and over and over and over again, though there was much hostility against them. Tonight we're going to be looking at the hostility against Israel in the book of Esther. His name is Haman. So we're going to look at that. We're going to learn three different lessons here about the enemies of God against the people of God. So first of all, number one, the first lesson that we're going to learn is that there are always enemies of God and His people until the end. There will always be enemies of God and His people until the end. Notice with me, verse number one, we're going to see and meet this man, Haman. It says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Ham Edatha, there it is, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. If you remember the book of Daniel, this is kind of what Darius the Mede does with Daniel. Daniel is part of the wise men group. But Darius, he wanted Daniel to be his number one guy. His right hand of command. He's like, all right, you're going to be my... And the word vizier is used a lot about a person, close counselor of the king. And this is exactly who Haman is for King Ahasuerus. Now, understand this. You might ask the question, if you read through the book of Esther, you might ask the question, where in the world did Haman come from? Because there's no mention of him before. Remember chapter 1 where, where Ahasuerus has his big party and has all of his, his, his princes and all the counselors are there. All these names I read and I did better on those names than I did in Genesis chapter 14 with the names there. Uh, but there was not a mention of the man Haman. So the question is, well, where did this guy come from? As you read through the text, it's amazing. Okay, so chapter 1, there is a jump from chapter 1 to chapter 2 of four years. From chapter 2 to chapter 3, there's also another jump of four to five years. And you can see that through the text. In chapter number 1, verse number 3, it says specifically what went it was during Ahasuerus' rule in the third year of his reign, he made all a feast unto all of his servants and his princes. So in the third year, then if you look in chapter 2, verse number 17, and no, that's not correct. Why did I write that? It's 16. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his royal house in the 10th month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. So we went from third year to seventh year. Now, chapter 3, verse number and verse number 7. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus. Okay, so we have jumped a lot during this timeline in the book of Esther in the first three chapters. And so Haman could have risen to prominence some point in time in the four years that are, that are silent in between chapter 2 and chapter 3. So four or five years has been coming, and Haman possibly comes out of nowhere and becomes the king's vizier. It kind of reminds me about every time we have a presidential election, for those who want to become president, they, they announce their candidacy, and most of the time I think to myself, who in the world is that? Because I have, you know, at times I don't really pay attention to some of the news and, and I'm better off for it, I think. Um, but anyway, so when Barack Obama was picked out as the guy for the presidential nomination, 
back in when I was in college, I said to myself, who's this guy? I have no idea who he is. For my rem- remembering of it, he only spent like two years in the Senate. Now he is now the number one guy for, for his party to become the President of the United States. It's so easy when a person becomes prominent for whatever reason, and that person is the person of the hour. And so Haman, just like that, in that somehow, some way, he got to where he is by his cunningness, by his smarts. I don't know how. He is a very smart, evidently, because you don't become the king's vizier with giving bad information. You know, if you decide to tell him, hey, you should do this, and it doesn't work out well for you, well, there's no job security right there. Um, so he must be a good advisor enough to get himself to that second seat, that, that counselor of the king. But then you notice with me in verse number 1 of chapter 3 who he's related to. It's interesting. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, there you go, the Agagite, and advanced him. So the word Agagite. Now, majority of scholars that I have looked up, there's only one that disagrees with this note, next notion, is that he says that this person is in the direct line with that of King Agag of the Amalekites. For those who don't know, King Agag, and I just read this the other day in my Bible reading. So here's what happened. Saul had the right and the privilege and the responsibility to obey God and says, okay, the Amalekites did something bad to my people back when in the wilderness. Now it's time for their sins to be punished. So Saul, go and destroy the Amalekites. And so Saul went out. Unfortunately, he did not obey God in that he left Agag alive. He left some of the sheep alive and all that. Well, eventually Agag will be, be killed by, by Samuel. But along the lines of Agag, evidently Agag is, is a term of a king of the Amalekites. So it's not just that one particular person, but it's any king of the Amalekites. And so in that line, somehow, some way, now we have Haman. Haman, who is now the king's counselor. Ugh. That's not a good sign for Israel. <laughs> it's not a good sign for Judah. It's not a good sign for the Jews. But then we get on and look on, and we see different things about uh, what happens with, king, with uh, Haman as now the enemy of of enemy of the Jews. Notice with me what happens. Verse number 2, And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed in reverence to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. So that gets us to uh, lesson number 2. There will always be enemies of God and His people until the end. Number 2, the root problem is always the same, and that's pride. The root problem of any enemy of God is pride against God. Notice with me what happens. So the king's commandment of bowing to Haman is given, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did give him reference. Notice with me what happens. Verse number 3. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now, you might be wondering, okay, is it against the Jewish religion to bow before a king? And the answer is not necessarily. There's nothing really in the law that says you can't bow unless it has something to do with idolatry. And a lot of times in the Persian kings, they proclaimed themselves to be like a god. And since Haman is now given the responsibility as the counselor, the chief vizier of every wise man, he has now been asked to to the king and says, can people now bow to me? And they said, yeah, that's fine. But Mordecai says, no, I'm not bowing. Now, there's a possibility that 
they shows forth that he could be like a deity or bowing down towards a deity. There's also this interesting story about that Haman would have a, a kind of idol in his pocket, a picture of an idol in his pocket, so every time somebody bows, he bows to his God. Well, in all reality, Mordecai does not want to bow before this Agagite. He does not want to bow before him, whether it be idolatrous or whatever have you. But he says it specifically because he's a Jew, he cannot bow. And so because of that, that creates a little bit of hostility in Haman. No kidding. Notice with me in verse number 4, Now it came to pass when they spake, notice this, daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. So Haman, he demands respect. He demands people bowing to him. All the servants of the gate, they do it, except for Mordecai. And it says daily, they're asking him, why aren't you bowing? It's so easy, just, just bow. All, of, all the rest of us do. We bow. Why don't you? Well, I can't. I'm a Jew. Haman, he says he's a Jew. Does, is that okay? Is, that, is people going to show reverence to you as uh, the Jewish people? They won't. Well, who else won't? So Haman has this pride issue, okay? So this one person does not want to bow to me. That one person. Oh. And then look on with me in verse number 6. Uh, no, verse number 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was <clears throat> excuse me, Haman full of wrath. He was prideful. He wanted people to bow to him. And this one person will not, for whatever reason, I believe it's the sin of pride that's in Haman that he wants, he thinks he deserves, that he should be bowed down to. And since this guy won't, he's going to do everything possible to get rid of not only him, but also everybody else that's related. Well, if this one Jew won't do it to me, the nation, the, all the people of the Jewish people, they won't do it either. Get rid of them all. That's what he is aiming for. So the root problem is always the same. Pride. Number three, lastly, the ultimate goal of the enemies of God is the destruction of God's people. Notice with me now his plan. Verse number, verse number six, And he, as Haman, thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him uh, the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. The, the room, the amount of the empire that the Persian Empire has at this point in time, it goes from the, the little bit in North Africa all the way over to that of India. Wow, that is a lot of space. And guess what? The majority of the Jews are somewhere scattered throughout all of that. They right now are in the promised land. They are with either Zerubbabel or that of uh, eventually Ezra or Nehemiah during this point in time. And so... Okay, they are going to be destroyed. How about the people in, well, Syria? How about the people in Africa? They're all scattered all throughout. Any number of people could be wiped out with just this one man's plot. Genocide. That's what he's after. He wants to destroy the entirety of the Jewish people. Terrible. And then not only that... But he gets the king to say yes to this. And not really even giving him much information. Notice with me what happens. Verse number 7. In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day, from month to month, and to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. So this casting of the lot usually entitles uh, somehow, some way, maybe throwing that of like dice type, of things casting lots, you throw it, and you see what the deities show forth. Now, true enough, the casting of the lot in this 
understanding. It, it's, it's probably to some false deities, but yet God is still in the midst of doing all this. That's why it is the specific time that it is. Notice with me, verse number 7. In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, that they cast pure before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. How much time do they give the Jewish people? They give them almost an entire year. An entire year for God to work out the details. For God to save His own people. Now, amazing thing. Now, if it was, okay, it's the second month. It's next month. Oh no. God still would have been able to. But God is still working out the details about everything that's going to happen and the salvation of His own people from, delivered from the cruelty of Haman. And so here we have what happens between Haman and the king. Verse number 8, And Haman said unto king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws I diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamath, Hamathdatha, and Agag, Agagite, the, king, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, and the people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. That's a problem. So he says, okay, there's a group of people that don't obey your laws, O king. There's a group of people that their laws are diverse from every other group. They are not respecting you, king, and you should just get, wipe them out. And I would say, let's give, give 10,000 uh, silver coins to people to do the job. What they're doing is offering money to anybody that will take and kill Jews. The amount of 10,000 silver coins uh, for today, you know how much it would be? $161 million for anybody that could kill the Jews. Now, it would be dispersed through all the people that try to and, and do that work. What an amazing thing. God's enemies taken advantage by that of money in order to get rid of God's people. And so, what happens? King Ahasuerus doesn't say, hey, let's look into the matter. Hey, let's not be oh, hasty. That, that's, that's kind of, you're, you're trying to have genocide. He just says, okay, and gives him the ring. The ring of power that says, yes, whatever he says is good. He trusts him so much that he's like, ah, it sounds good to me. You worry, the, you worry about the details. I'll go from there. But here, Haman, <laughs> he, he plans all this out, and then the letters go out. Notice with me what the result of it. Verse number 15, the post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed. They didn't know what to do. What's going on? entire group of people to be executed that's different that's weird that's odd for the king to have signed this and so they are looking and saying what is going on with the king to be so hasty in this this condemnation of this people so we see over and over and over again the enemies of god they're real and the the group the, the Jewish people have always been assaulted for who they are. The latest one that you can think of is probably that of World War II with the Jews being trying to be exterminated by that of Adolf Hitler. Oh, we see that all throughout history. We go to uh, Daniel chapter 11, talks about the Grecian Empire and how bad they were, and spe specifically that of Antiochus Epiphanes, who makes himself like a god and de desecrates the temple, put, spills pig's blood all over the place to desecrate it, and he says you should 
only serve and worship me. And sets up a uh, statue of Zeus, which uh, uh, some commentators have said it as probably in his image uh, that he made it. And he wanted to destroy the Jews. Over and over and over again, people want to destroy the Jews. Eventually, there will come a person named the Antichrist who will try to destroy the Jews, but God will not let them. See, this is great. Esther is a book about how God will deliver His people out of the worst circumstances to show forth His own glory. God, even though there's enemies of God, God will win. I love my youth pastor. He, he was going through the book of Revelation. I didn't agree with everything he said. But one thing that, I re- that really caught hold of my attention is his summary of the entire book. He says, if you don't get anything else out of our study right here, two words, the theme of Revelation. God wins. That's it. <laughs> I thought that is very simple but very profound. No matter what the circumstances against God's people, God wins. Uh, no matter who comes against the nation of Israel, God wins. No matter who comes against and what comes against the church, think about enemies coming against us. Persecution is a real thing for, for thousands of Christians every single year are martyred. You don't know that. 10,000 Christians a year, I heard the, the, uh, the statistic, are murdered every single year for Christ. They'll say, well, not in America. You're right. Probably not in America. But persecution probably is going to be coming. As we get closer and closer to the end times, the more and more people want to love that which is wrong and hate that which is good. And we see that over and over again that our, our culture is becoming more and more godless, more and more wanting and accepting of things that are contrary to God's Word. And so because of that, we have so many enemies coming against us, but God wins. It's amazing. We can get through anything because God wins. Uh, just because there are enemies coming against the people of God, God wins. Ultimately, Haman's plan is going to fall apart. We know this. For those who, who doesn't, don't know the book of Esther, God wins. <laughs> Amen. We still have the Jews today. God wins. He doesn't let this happen. But rather, He does something to counteract it. And so we're going to get more into that as we move on in chapter 4 and chapter 5. And we see Haman's plot just kind of fail because God ultimately is in control. So what we can get away get from this text here that no matter what happens, no matter who comes against the people, the children of God, God will win. And even though people might be murdered, I read about Jeremiah being stoned to death. I read about Isaiah being cut in sunder. I heard about all these different people that were Martyred in Fox Book of Martyrs. So many people died for their faith. And that could be us. But even if that happens, God wins. Just remember that. If you're discouraged about something going on in your life, God wins. God wins. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for giving us this time together to look into Your Word. And Father, we ask You to help us, to encourage us, knowing that You ultimately are in control. No matter who's in control here on earth, You are ultimately in control, put, providing for us Your perfect plan. We thank You for Your providence. We thank You for Your goodness. We thank You for working amidst the evil that's in this world to bring about the good of Your own people and to give you all the glory. Father, may you encourage us tonight with that thought. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to just sing.